check if uh, sometimes I know and sometimes I don't know. Are we out of doors today? Okay. Iced coffee. Unintentionally so. Uh, welcome also to those of you who are joining online where you can't see the sanctuary, but in your own sanctuaries, we wish you a peaceful and uh, worshipful morning together. Uh, I was marking down announcements and special events just for the next seven days, and they're really First off, this morning, uh, those of our children who are here are going to help to put together uh, treat bags. Is that the right term? Something close to treat bags for the Newton Food Pantry. More about the Newton Food Pantry in a week or two uh, as we reach out with Thanksgiving meals, as we did last year. And a number of people have signed up for that already. Um, if you're wondering, and you may or may not be, uh, Lind is in Louisiana with his family this morning, but we are fortunate to have Yumiko leading us on piano and Ted in song. There will be more news this week because the outreach to Afghan refugees has uh, started kicking into at least central gear. Um, and keep, I, I'm not, this is not my favorite thing to say, but keep your eye on the website. Um, donations are welcome. We're getting closer and closer. We think the family will be here in a week, two weeks. We have no control over that. Next Sunday, if there are children in your world, since uh, it is Halloween, come for a special prelude and a special time of celebration. Halloween, of course, is also Reformation Sunday, so we'll, with the candlelight in the pumpkins, we'll also sneak in a little word about Martin Luther. Tomorrow morning uh, at 11 and then at 11.30, we will remember the life of David Cain, the Reverend David Cain, member here for a good long while, active in the choir, even when he was in a wheelchair, parked there. Uh, moved to be, he, he and his wife were in different care facilities. Two weeks ago, Wednesday, he moved to the care facility where Lillian, his wife, was. And this Wednesday, two weeks after he had arrived there, peacefully, in his sleep, at the age of 90, he completed his life. Tomorrow morning, there is a viewing, uh, which is a, a good old-fashioned uh, and formal way to do things at 11 a.m. here in this room, and then 11.30 a.m. memorial worship. Actually, it's funeral worship, and burial in Hingham thereafter. Uh, you're invited, especially if you're able to come be with us in worship, where once again, Ted will be singing and leading us. You could open the book of Psalms almost anywhere. The book of Psalms has a great tradition. Uh, they were meant to be songs. This is a little quatrain that helped. It's not standard pulpit fare, uh, but it doesn't have any dirty or naughty words in it, except maybe for the word concubine. It is an old-fashioned teaching message, and it goes like this. King David and King Solomon had wicked, wicked lives with many, many concubines and many, many wives. So when their lives were ending, they had many, many qualms. So Solomon wrote the Proverbs, and David wrote the Psalms. You can open the Psalms almost anywhere and find a first line that leads you into worship, such as this one from Psalm 29. Praise God, all who are created in the divine image. Praise God for glory and strength. Praise God, wonder is the eternal name. Bow down before the source of life. Be witness to holy splendor. Let us lift up our voices, standing if we're able, and sing to the holy splendor of all creatures of our God and King.
morning. Please join me in the prayer of invocation and joy. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Ever you had formed the world and the world from everlasting to everlasting. Um, this is Mark 46 to 52. It comes right after a story we might have heard last week where Jesus was not happy with two of his disciples for asking for special favors. But this one, he gives a complete stranger a special favor. Um, and they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebu rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Thus speaks the Bible. Good morning. This morning we have a special guest, Marilyn Crone, from the Newton Food Pantry. So welcome. NH at NHCC, we have been working on filling our buckets with love, joy, peace, patience, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and kindness. It was clear to me when I was thinking about our guest speaker, that Marilyn is always helping other people and, and all the while filling up her own bucket. Did you know that every time you say or do something caring or thoughtful, you add good thoughts and feelings to someone else's bucket and your own bucket gets filled all the way up too. So Marilyn, would you please come up here for a moment? So here is Marilyn's bucket. <laughs> and this is why she gets a bucket today. She is a retired, loving elementary teacher. Well, you definitely get one for that. <laughs> She's got a bucket full of parts here. She is going to help the children today coordinate snack bags for the children between the end of school and when they have dinner. You'll get this bag. It has about nine things in it, and um, it gives them sustenance during that time. So here's your other part. And then she's been a volunteer there for over three years. She definitely gets a heart. And the last heart, which will be many more because she has to empty one, will be for she's visiting us today. 
and she's taken the time out to help us understand what food insecurity means in Newton. And there are going to be people who don't really understand that. I don't understand that. You know, when we deliver food to people in Newton, there's a lot of people with 1,600, 1600 clients during the pandemic. That's a lot of children, a lot of families. So, here's, so we're going to pray now. You can stay up here. Let us pray before we go off to church school. Dear God, you made us and you love us. Guide us as we keep working toward finding ways to multiply, expand, and grow in love one bucket at a time. Amen. Out of the We have three psalms today, four or five before we leave the room. Three songs, poems from the song book, the poem book, the wisdom book in our Bible. The first paragraph of the prayer of invocation is basically Psalm 90, a portion of Psalm 90. The second psalm comes to us from the day's lectionary. It is Psalm 34, portions thereof. Listen, if you will, for how something almost the opposite of what happens in the gospel happens. In the gospel, there's this moment that's hidden in plain sight, as so many are. Bartimaeus knows that Jesus of Nazareth is coming, but then without being told, Bartimaeus knows that it's Jesus, the son of David. He grasps his title and speaks to him as God without being told that that's what's up. Here in the first portion of Psalm 34, the speaker does not speak to God at all. It's about God, but it's not to God. And then it shifts. So listen for the word of God and the shift in the way that we speak in this, the first of two Psalms. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look at God, and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried, and was heard by the Lord, and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from them all. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken, Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in God will be condemned. And now, moving over to a very recent translation, actually a scholar from Brookline, Pamela Greenberg for Psalm 126. Psalm 126 in the Greenberg translation. When the Redeemer returns the exiles to Zion, we will have been like dreamers. 
Then our mouths will overflow with laughter, our tongues with cries of joy. Then it will be said among the nations, God has created with grandeur on behalf of these people. God will act with wonder toward us. The thought fills us with joy. The Holy One has glorified us by name. We will be as though having been in the divine presence throughout. Return us, O God, from our exile and the sudden stream beds in the Negev. Those who plant seeds with tears of sorrow will gather the harvest with songs of joy. The one who walks even while weeping, lifting the seed as he goes, will return with gladness, carrying the sheaves of corn. From which our hymn, Bringing in the Sheaves, is derived. From which the commitments of God to not break our bones is derived. From which we hear this connection of the psalmist in one case speaking of his urgent needs and blessings and in another looking at how this is connected to all the cosmos. I invite you to pause for a moment. Whether you're at home online or here together and allow prayer to connect us with God. How wondrous are your words, O God. How amazing your gifts. Hear our cries and our words. Bless our songs. Bless our silent prayers. Bless us so that the words of my lips and the meditations in our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Yet yeah, well, Once again this week I was reading through some psalms and reading through some songs, reading through some hymns to prepare for a memorial service. And sometimes I wonder why I don't take more time to read psalms, but it got me thinking if we ever wonder why we do have songs and poems in our worship, we wonder if they stick with us when we leave. A lot of you will, will know, maybe all of you will know, the somewhat famous William Carlos Williams line, it is difficult to get the news from poems, but many die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. If the US Congress were investigating poems, they might say, well, well, they connect the dots. Or if an artist was investigating the Psalms, they might say, well, actually, they paint the dots. Now, you've, you've heard this also, and it's true. I know it's true. It's an old preacher's chestnut. No one ever leaves worship humming the sermon. So. We have songs and psalms that rhyme and have reasons. We have music that we can hum as we go forth. We have faith's poetry. We sang one psalm last week, and we're going to sing another one tomorrow for David, but I'm not sure if I emphasize them enough. A little epigram earlier about Solomon and David and what they did or didn't write is really neat because it rhymes, but it's factually inaccurate. If you turn to the end of Psalm 72, it says right there, this is it for David's material. There's no more, even though there are 78 Psalms, 79 for some, still to come. But each and every Psalm, no matter who constructed it, is a simple, personal, deeply incarnate invitation to look at scripture from a personal angle instead of as a proof text or an impossibility. It is the most manifestly normal stuff in all scripture. Psalms provide us a pattern for our own prayers. And as I think about my own life here, 19 months into a pandemic, 15 months into a new economy, 
10 months into a new presidency, the Psalms have street talk, human hunger, and cosmic care. In their very context, they create sacred safe space for each of us when we're alone and for all of us when we're together. They scream and they sing and they suffer silence. So this morning, the, the one psalm I read, 34, it does not even speak to God. It's interpersonal. It's for others to hear. And then later on comes this psalm which names exile, weeping, tears, and hard work, putting them in God's context. The psalms give us words for prayer. And if you are like me, when you come into this sanctuary, you do not leave behind the prayers that you might need. Maybe it's something about your children. It is for me. Maybe it's something about women's health care in one state in particular. It is for me. Maybe it's the wonder that it was 77 degrees on October 21st. That's my birthday. It's the warmest birthday of my life. And I come from a state down south of here. Psalms cite human needs for human souls. Psalms are not about doctrine. They're about emotion. So, if any part of you comes from the off-color, vengeful, spiteful, anguished wing of Christianity, that's a big wing, there are psalms for you. If any part of you comes from the tender, hopeful, mournful, yearnful wing of our faith, there are psalms for you. You can start right out of the beginning. Psalm 1 says right out of the gate, the wrongful will not stand in the light of justice. Psalm 1 lays down justice as an essential ingredient of our faith before we get to any of the others, no matter who wrote them. Right out of the gate, we get clear that God is political, interpersonal, and fair. But then jump ahead a bit to Psalm 137, where the writer says, I am tired, I am weak, and I am so worn out by injustice that I wish the bright lights of your future, says the psalmist, your children, would be smashed. Actually, I did not quote that exactly. You can look up the end of Psalm 137. But there's anger, there's revenge, and there's hatred in the psalms. Aristotle said that mimesis means imitating the created order. And catharsis means releasing, purging our anxiety and our fear. And the Psalms have both. One of my great and beloved mentors was a recovering alcoholic for many decades. And one of his favorite lines in all scripture is in Psalm 51. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice blot out my sins. That's a rough phrase. And no one wants to think that God would break their bones. In fact, if you were listening carefully, in Psalm 34, it says specifically that God does not. But my friend, years before I knew him, had hit rock bottom, broken bones. And he was really sure still that God had not abandoned him and that he had a future and he loved that psalm. Anyone who has ever been injured in their own home, struck, abused by their own family, or by a friend, finds abuse directly addressed in Psalm 55, where the speaker cries out, it is not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It is you my companion, my familiar friend. The speaker calls out for God to stay nearby. That's the petition. The ten at the end says, let death come upon my abuser. Let them go down to hell alive in terror. Well, you can read it for yourself. This is catharsis and prayer and a program that we may or may not like, 
all wrapped up in one psalm in our Bible. Just up the street, Pamela Greenberg translated the whole book of Psalms anew uh, 11 years ago. And she said in the introduction that the project started for her when she was going through a depression. And she started out because she could find psalms that gave voice to her despair. But then as she read her way through the psalms, she noticed that almost everywhere they're populated with these outbursts of joy. And then they have this thanksgiving for God's proximity in all creation. And they go on and on to the edges of the cosmos with celebration. And she, Greenberg, says that what she started because of her depression, she ended with something that rebuilt her faith entirely. Jesus quoted a psalm on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he quoted one in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Paul quotes psalms. And actually the opening line of Psalm 110 is quoted 18 times. It's the bit about who sits with God in heaven that shows up over and over again. Some of our favorite hymns are psalms. Our God, our help in ages past. A mighty fortress is our God. And about a hundred more. But the reason I'm sharing all this this morning is I think a lot of Protestants, sometimes me, have fallen out of the habit of just exploring the Psalms, reading the Psalms, testing out the Psalms, which are very good at bedtime when you are settling in peacefully or when you are settling in the opposite peacefully, of peacefully and you need some peace. Here's the first line of Psalm 116 in Greenberg's translation. I love you, God, for you listen to my voice, my prayers for solace in a time of need. It is absolutely self-centered. It is absolutely specific. And it is absolutely transcendent all the same. I love you, God, for you listen to my voice. Her translation of Psalm 149 starts this way. Praise God. Sing out to God a new song. Praise the Holy One wherever the faithful gather. If all the Psalms had to be reduced to one theme, which is, of course, impossible and even wrong, this is the core of their call. Sing out to God a new song in a poem in a pandemic, asking, have we changed anything in 19 months? Sing out with a psalm for women who live in a state that outlaws their agency. Sing out, as we might have done last week, talking about the cosmic Christ who wonders about how we treat creation. Psalms always inspire new songs. And then, of course, many of us like the old song. And some people don't want any new things. You can read it on their lawn sign in Newton. Some like the old economy, ignoring the fact that many, many, many people aren't even in the old economy. Sing out to God a new song, says the psalm, even when you are tired and weak and worn. Listen to all of Psalm 149 and form your own insight. Listen, the words are clear enough about the core of God's call. Praise God. Sing out to God a new song. Praise the Holy One wherever the faithful gather. Let Israel rejoice in its maker. The children of Zion exult in their source of hope. Praise God's name with dancing. Make melodies with the drums and the harp. For you take pleasure in your people, beautifying the humble with salvation. Faithful exult in your glory. They will sing out upon their beds songs of elevation in their throats and a double-edged sword in their hands. 
to right the wrong of nations, to bring rebuke upon countries that rebel, to imprison their kings with chains, their tyrants with fetters of iron, to bring them to you for justice, as it is written, splendor is known to all who love you. Praise God, says the psalmist, for I love you, God, who listen to our voices. One of the losses of the pandemic is proximity. If you've been connected to this parish for a while, or even somewhat recently, you know that one of my commitments over the years has been getting us closer and closer together. We moved the communion table from there to here. We moved the baptisms from there to here. I like to be on the main floor for homilies and prayers. So I will stay six feet away from any of you and mask. We are allowed to unmask up there. But I want to ask you uh, if there's a word or a name, a person or a concern that you want to lift up in prayer today. And I can't hear you well enough up there. So I'm going to walk to the middle for a little proximity. And simply ask if there is something that you would like spoken aloud today. And I think I heard Arlene, yes, who was beginning chemotherapy. 
many psalms which are cries for healing. And did I hear it with a V, Velma? Mel. Mel. Ah. Mel and Arlene and Dick. Angela, who I have met. Many songs for healing. Congregational churches used to have clear glass in their windows, so there was virtually no separation between indoors and outdoors. The stained glass means that the way we get the light is through the story, and that's a good idea too. So with the light and the story, knowing that there is no separation between where we are and where God is, I invite you to pray and to conclude our prayers with the Lord's Prayer. God of the psalmist and the singer, God of the sower and the reaper, God who can, perhaps metaphorically, bring a camel through the eye of a needle, who can, even when we're blind, reveal to us who Jesus is, God who does stay with us, and who will be in our future. Remind us and encourage us in our thanksgiving and love for Dick, and Angela, and Velma, for David Kane, for those who we hold in our own hearts. Be with us and remind us that the eternity we preach and sing is not something that disappears when times are hard, even though the hard times draw from us some of the tiredness and the weakness that you can transform into strength. Be with us and remind us that you are always with us. We pray for our world today, for cool heads, for cool weather, for the composure that allows us to see one another, care for one another, feed one another, and share a blessing with one another. We pray today for the composure that is part of your Holy Spirit. And we pray also that we have the compassion to speak our words in urgency, in necessity, in community. So be with us in our humanity, as Jesus would have it, as the psalmist would have it, as you would have it. Be with us today, tomorrow, and forever. Inspired by the way that almost everything Jesus did made a connection between earth and heaven, and so his prayer does that same thing. And we share it together to re-inspire ourselves and to lift up our worship for you as we say, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen.
if you have a minute, when you have a minute, throw open the book of Psalms somewhere, anywhere. 22, 23, and 24 go together nicely. Don't start with 119. It's too long. Throw open the book of Psalms and see how someone from three millennia ago almost speaks not only to you, but for us, speaks to God and with us. Throw open your hearts and see how God's word is alive in us through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, through what we say to one another, what we pray for one another, for this day with one another in God's name. Let all the people say amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah.